Hello, everybody, and welcome to ETBFSI Summit. My name is Mushir Ahmed. I'm founder and managing director of Finstep Asia, a venture build, builder based in Hong Kong, working with corporates as well as uh, scale ups on their market expansion and innovation in Asia. Today, we have a very exciting panel of uh, eminent and esteemed uh, panelists. We will be talking about innovation in a borderless environment. With us are uh, Ms. Ratna Prabha. Manika Vachagam, sorry for the pronunciation, Mr. Ellis Wang, Mr. Ash Malik, Mr. Bharat Raizada. Pleasure to have you all. We have a very extensive experience in global franchises uh, as well as from east to west, right, all the way till the, the Mashtek as it were. Um, starting off with, you know, the first question is a lot of you are quite, act all, rather all of you are quite actively involved in, uh, in looking at international uh, setup for your banks. Um, can you give us an insight on how your bank is set up for cross-border processes, cross-border interaction? Do you have uh, innovation teams uh, looking into this space? Uh, maybe we can start with Ash and then we can go with others. DB is a universal bank, which means we have corporate banking, investment banking, private banking, and DWS, which is our asset management arm, all offering global products and services. But as a firm, we believe passionately in what we call globalization. What this means in practice is that we value the diversity of the local culture and having deep expertise of the local market and reg environment on the ground itself. So this means we've got regional SMEs in place for each country and market. They're globally aligned, so we can provide a 24-hour round the clock support to our clients. But they are based in every single country. Now, to give you an idea of the benefit of this model, in the first six months of 2020, Deutsche Bank trans transacted a record $15 billion um, of US dollars of local Asian currency FX, all for clients and all outside the normal Asian market hours. And this kind of intense customer focus led to DB being awarded the Crisis Response of the Year Award from Asia Risk in September. We also have what we call country management structures, which work very closely with our desks, but they play a critical role in establishing strong relationships with local regulations and governments. So for example, late last year, DB became the first European bank to re receive approval from Safe Shanghai um, to, to join its pilot payment scheme. And that objective is to expand cross-border product and trades and simplify the payment process. So a DB customer now no longer has to perform a long onerous process and instead can execute an FX payment in seconds. Additionally, um, with a growing trend of fintech companies expanding their footprint in Asia, we're partnering with fintechs and helping them with their expansion plans, especially overseas. And we're also connecting fintechs across the region. So for example, in November last year, in collaboration with, with InvestKL, we hosted the fintech virtual roundtable for Chinese fintech companies who were keen to learn more about Malaysian fintech landscape. Um, so overall, as an umbrella for innovation, uh, and working with fintechs, we have a global network of innovation teams with offices in London, New York, Berlin, Palo Alto, and Singapore, actually. And these teams support the four divisions, the four business divisions, and infra to help identify, evaluate, and then support the adoption of strategic emerging technologies. And essentially, we do that through three key channels. We have a demand-driven model where we co-innovate and collaborate with our customers on the ground. Um, and this usually starts with a specific question from a business or infra area. And then our innovation network finds suitable innovative solutions from startups, or sometimes we just decide to invest in internal development. Secondly, we have a scouting team, and, and this team um, monitors the key technologies and capabilities which the bank considers to be strategic. So that includes cryptocurrency, enterprise blockchain, which we all know is going to be critical going forwards for cross-border transaction, and other technology like quantum computing and so on. This knowledge is then used by our internal incubation teams or any other DB team for that matter, for co-innovating and collaborating with customers and partners. And then finally, what we have is what we call internal incubation. And this is a comprehensive entrepreneurship program for all DBs and uh, all employees in DB, which we started about two years back. And it's designed to identify the bank's most passionate innovators and give them a platform to engage and to actively drive the agenda forwards. So ideas are proposed, they pitch to an internal venture board, and then they can be internally incubated and developed. So that gives you an idea of how broadly we work uh, in DB. Thank you. Um, Ratna, very much like Ash, uh, you know, Sakjan is a, is a European bank with, with a large presence in Asia and, and beyond. Uh, how, how have you been uh, looking at cross-border uh, transactions as well as how is the innovation team set up? Thank you for the question. I'm able to relate a lot to what Ash just said, um, considering we're a European bank present across around 60 countries. Uh, 
Sakhdin also has a major investment banking arm, a retail banking arm within France, as well as the international uh, retail bank uh, that, that is present across several countries. There we are the leading bank, especially in, in um, Czechoslovakia, Russia type of uh, areas. So from a presence uh, of the innovation team, there's a centralized innovation team in Paris, head headquartered in Paris. And this particular innovation team uh, looks at mergers, acquisitions, uh, open banking models, um, a lot of collaboration with the GAFAs and looking at a variety of ways to do cross-border um, interactions and also uh, working with the peer banks. And uh, as they discover models, I'm sure uh, they are working with all the remaining 26 to 27 departments that we have on all these three major arms that I just spoke about, investment banking, retail banking, as well as international banking. And that is how the, the, the innovation setup in Paris works. Now, being an outpost in Asia, uh, so myself leading the innovation and, and uh, digital transformation divisions, we are extremely execution focused where we directly look at the business and use, business use cases from the various uh, businesses and give hands-on solutions, working with FinTechs, working with our internal center of excellences, uh, working with the research universities, uh, creation of products, AI, and um, especially on emerging technologies. And then we also have major uh, work that we deliver on complete fund and um, value chain transformations and product transformations and delivering key customer experiences. So this is the kind of work we do as an outpost uh, in Asia. And we also interact with the remaining 16 uh, innovation ecosystems that we have set up within SOCGEN, which is, you know, when I say outpost in Asia, we have smaller outposts even in Singapore and Hong Kong. And we have uh, slightly larger setups of innovation in Americas and um, other parts of Europe, especially in Romania and Eastern Europe. So the innovation ecosystem is quite interlinked inside SOCGEN. While we are connected on the strategy of each of the delivering business, which means we have a very good connect with um, the extended teams of the businesses in Asia, in India and Romania. And the mandate is that we work with the rest of the group. For example, I can pitch for a RFP in um, uh, Parkebi Bank, located in Czechoslovakia, we call it the Comencheni Bank. And I can equally uh, pitch for something in Africa. So for example, we conducted a program for Africa where we identified eight startups to innovate uh, for our African businesses out of India. So we have that kind of mandate where we are quite interlinked, quite connected strategically, understanding where each of the businesses need help, uh, you know, either to um, improve the product offerings or to impact the top line or for a customer experience or to completely introduce something new on the digital scale uh, for our businesses. So the setup of innovation is quite central and local, uh, like the way Ash mentioned. The localized setup is quite convenient for the 15,000 people, for example, that are in the offshore and nearshore entities to work with. At the same time, what, re what is really helpful is to be connected to the strategic interests, for example, the payments business, the cross-border payments that you spoke about. If there's a consortium in France that is looking into cross-border payments, we would naturally have a major, uh, for example, we have either a research link or a complete technical provider link with that consortium kind of a setup where we are um, working on all these major strategic areas that need innovation. At least I would say we don't work on all of them, but we prioritize six to seven every year where we would like to have a major impact. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Ellis, you, know, you, you are based uh, uh, in the Middle East and Mashaik Bank has been one of the oldest banks uh, in the region uh, with the with the international spread as well, more on the private banking, but it's been growing. How, how do you approach cross-border innovation and how is your team set up for that? Since the COVID, so mostly uh, Convention Bank actually start to provide a digital service. So that means we move the, the, our server application to the cloud, start to provide more the digital uh, channels for our client to use the app, the web, to get it the same similar service. Then we call that is the uh, contactless the, uh, service again. So based on that, actually a lot of new technology have to adapt to 
uh, the banking system, for example. When we talk about the AI ML, actually we drive in not just the uh, increased uh, internal productivity uh, and uh, efficiency. We also use that to service the customer because the, when we have the more idea to know about a customer and we can provide a customized service for them, they just the uh, more keep, make their life easier, can have a regular financial service, routine notify them. So uh, after uh, COVID, actually our team, we call the one digital team, actually start to focus on the digital inside and the digital outside. What that means, inside is how you to leverage the AIM or data driven to increase the whole band operation, reduce the cost. I think that's quite important. Yeah, because uh, you know, the pandemic is not really uh, have the uh, economy growth so how we to reduce the operation costs? That means we have to use the technology to have the more the highway STP end-to-end -end automation, intelligent to support the whole process. I think that part is quite important, especially for the bank. The second, when we move to the cloud, have the more the digital channel uh, touch point for our client. How you to management? Is the same client, but how they use a uh, app? Now, but later they use a web portal, then use the ATM, use a different channel. How you to service us a one? So that's why we have an innovation thing called a one digital. But since the uh, commission ban moved from the uh, latency system to open banking, so we also got the opportunity to design the digital inside out. What it means is that the use the bank the call like a payment to engage with a different market player. Since the pandemic, so uh, e-commerce the business grows up very quick. How you to service the e-commerce the client uh, as your partner, engage with your uh, partner to build an ecosystem. So digital insight actually is how you to leverage your bank the API, can engage with the more and more the service provider. So digital insight is very new topic, very important for the bank. And based on the digital insight strategy, you can combine the more different services like insurance, wealth management, supply chain, finance service, a trading business. Then based on the micro strategy, the open API, then you can engage more and more the partner to service your client by, ad, by providing end-to-end -end service. And not just the digital insight out, we also need to think about the digital outside in. What it means? Because the, as a bank, we have the uh, channel to touch our uh, potential customer. But you know, the social media is so popular. Uh, everybody have a LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook. Um, how you to use the external digital channel to targeting your potential customer, even to make a good the, uh, customer life cycle management. So, when we think about a new age coming, because everything talk about the cloud age. So how you to prepare for the hybrid operation, combine your data center and cloud operation at this time and follow the compliance and make it ma uh, management risk. So the one digital thing in Marshall Band is need to think about how to leverage emerging technology to cover digital inside, digital outside, digital inside out, digital outside in as one, then based on a cloud and one data to build a new service the, uh, platform to have the Marshall Bank move from a uh, convenience bank to the open banking to the digital banking. So definitely the innovation team is quite important is you have to know your customer, uh, also new, know your new technology, combine it to design a new uh, customer journey to service your corporate customer or consumer customer. So yeah, definitely we have that team. Uh, inside out and uh, outside in is an important element of engaging on both sides, uh, right? Uh, Bharat, you, you lead teams in uh, two large countries in, in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and uh, there must be a lot of interaction that goes on between the two teams uh, quite actively. So I'd love to get your insights in terms of how is the team set up for Wells and uh, what, what, are, what are the kind of innovation that you've been uh, focusing on from a cross border perspective? No, I think, and wish it a great question. And I was listening to some of my other colleagues talk about this. So, just quickly about Wells Fargo, right? Uh, one of the largest banks in the US, 
one in three uh, U.S. households is a Wells Fargo customer. So there's a big responsibility we carry. If if I look at Wells Fargo Indian Philippines, uh, the way we are set up, I think Wells Fargo has embraced, I would say, cross-border, borderless uh, organization and innovation quite actively. Uh, we've been in the been in Indian Philippines for more than a decade, and I have experience in prior organizations as well. And when I look at some of the some of the work we've done here at Wells Fargo, I think it's truly entrenched as part of the global organization. You see a lot of uh, front to back teams, uh, conversations around product ownership, as well as innovation being driven out of India and Philippines, which is a really, really good thing. Your, your question on innovation is spot on. So just going to the top of the house, there is an organization called Strategy Digital Platforms and Innovation, which reports right up to the CEO. That organization is focused on driving innovation across the organization, accelerating the value we provide to our customers. This SDI organization works closely with all lines of businesses within Wells Fargo. The SDI organization has a presence in India, Philippines as well. And we continue to work actively from a technology standpoint. We work very closely with the SDI organization to understand some of the new innovation requirements, a short term, as well as longer term that we might want to invest in. Uh, some of the good examples are, for example, from an innovation standpoint, we work with Academia very actively. Uh, so the MIT, Stanford of the world, as well as we are having conversations for India as well, uh, to look at some of the forward-looking technologies. There's a big play from a compute standpoint, if you think of quantum computing coming in, which has, I think, a bunch of implications, important ones being on how can we rapidly calculate risk on financial transactions, as well as look at how we think of cryptography from, from that standpoint. There is obviously a big, big play on the third aspect I would talk about from an innovation standpoint is how do we in the interplay of data? So yes, the problem of big data, but also the big problem of small data, so to say, which means how can we take smaller data sets and use some of that to train as well as sharpen some of the models we have using synthetic data transactions. So a lot of the work that I talk about from an innovation standpoint gets done not just in our global locations, but as well in India and Philippines. So a very uh, integrated organization is how I would put it, where cross-border innovation as well as transactions happen fairly seamlessly. Thanks, Bharat. Um, that takes me to the next question where we, we build on from understanding how your teams are set up to now talking a little bit about digital transformation, right? And uh, how the teams are set up for that internally, because innovation is a very key element. And uh, wanted to ask, uh, Ellis Bharat and uh, Ratna on this is how are your teams set up? What's the approach? And uh, how big is the role do centers in play, uh, in places like India, et cetera, play, right? Uh, for, for different banks, it's a different setup. Some have it as their uh, centers of excellence and some of them have it as their uh, back offices. So we'd love to hear your viewpoints on that. Let's start with Ratna on this. The digital transformation is definitely a very key part of the strategy since uh, I would say on digital transformation as a bank. So we knew it in 2015, 14, late 14, I guess, that we were slightly late uh, from a beginning standpoint. Uh, nevertheless, I think today where we stand in 2021 is quite impressive from, a, from what we have achieved. And the setup itself from the digital transformation is, um, is at the department level, uh, typically, because you have digital transformation led by both the business and IT primarily. And I consider that the digital transformation aid that the innovation teams provide is quite significant as, as an facilitator, accelerator, typically. So uh, from a digital transformation standpoint, the setups that we have is uh, local, uh, for example, in India and Romania, for which I'm responsible for. There are local teams of data scientists of of, uh, process transformation, DTOs, uh, cybersec teams, etc., located within the uh, within the divisions. Now, the way we interact with those divisions is that I also have a central team uh, of over 100 people. Now, how we perform is, you know, uh, we are grouped as departments within innovation. For example, I have an open innovation department. I have a digital transformation department. I have AI uh, and emerging tech products department, and then. Um, we also have a business consulting department. So the consulting department quite leads the way in terms of doing large studies, 
in, in identifying the opportunities, both the market opportunities outside for some of the areas where we have innovated, as well as uh, internal opportunities for which we could, uh, you know, scale up uh, the solutions that we have created. So the consulting leads the studies, consulting leads the marketing and business development effort. For example, I'm a PNL division where typically uh, we do not ask SOGGEN to invest in our uh, innovation uh, division. So the PNL that we have at the end of the year is quite sufficient to manage the cost of the department as well as to invest in various programs and, and technologies and uh, other investments that we need to make. So the so the model itself has evolved in the last, uh, we are in the sixth year of running right now. So digital transformation opportunities that we gather uh, starts with study, assessing the market opportunity, providing a POC and then MVP, and then uh, working at that point of time, collaboration and co-creation along with the IT departments becomes the key in the transformation aspect and working with the respective transformation departments becomes a key. Collaboration co-creation at this level is also extended to the customer experience. We have the design department stepping in at the point of time and to understand uh, what, how the customer impact will be felt with each of these transformations is a very key input, uh, you know, at, at, at least three or four points in the whole life cycle of the transformation. And of course, uh, now we also follow a new operating model where at the MVP stage, we involve the users, you know, if not customers, the users of the uh, transformation, transformed product or a transformed platform. Uh, in terms of uh, rating the experience, rating the transformation, reimagination of the, or the complete uh, new creation, and taking that as a as a real input in terms of going ahead with the integration of these efforts into the target target platform that the the, the strategy the IT strategy uh, involves. Now the digital transformation again is a very very huge topic. Uh, mostly every in the beginning of every year, led by the business. This year, for example, late 2020, the the retail department we have. Uh, group of subsidiaries, which we call as Credit du Nord in France, over 30 subsidiaries uh, integrating with our uh, French retail bank. And that's a huge merger of sorts, which we have not uh, done in the last 15 years. So integrating all the IT platforms, IT systems, applications, uh, bringing in the customers of the two entities onto a common platform is now planned for a um, duration of around three years. So we call this program Yoga and uh, the entire bank comes together to pitch in and make, make this program a huge success so that we can realize the savings of the efficiency of doing such a major merger within uh, successful. Similarly, the investment, ba investment banking division launches a lot of digital transformation programs to which the whole IT, what we call as IT failure, is a group of IT divisions that come together to see how we reuse um, various applications, how we reuse, reuse foundations, how we reuse infrastructure, especially and uh, especially in going to hybrid cloud. How do we do the various mi migrations and launch programs for low code, no code together, or the cloud migrations together? So, all of these efforts on the digital transformation is also key to achieving the transformation successfully. I think as a bank, we have learned now how to launch it in one area and then quickly be able to scale it up in other areas and benefit from that. And uh, we do have a structure which is transversal to see the, um, to monitor, I would say, the various transformations happening in various businesses while they are monitored at the business level. To achieve it at the IT scale, I think we have uh, quite a few organization structure that have changed in the last two years to achieve these measures. Happy the way that digital transformation is um, carrying forward. And then just to add lastly is, you know, on the open banking areas where we are digitally transforming and the mobile space, et cetera, the involvement of the external ecosystem is a key factor, especially fintechs. So um, we do have local programs, especially in India and Romania, where we introduce the Asian uh, strength back to the uh, French ecosystem and the reverse also. And now we have also uh, the big uh, companies uh, across the world in US as well as Europe pitching in and helping us with our transformation to speed it up. So all in all, I think it's going pretty well. Thank you. Uh, Bharat, how, how are you approaching this from a wealth cargo perspective and your own personal uh, leadership? So from a digital standpoint, uh, the, the way I would look at it is 
all aspects of business are focusing on digital, be it digital account opening, be it online loan approvals, or be it a wire transfer. The world is really moving towards digital. And I think some of over the last year, this thing has only accelerated. The digital focus, I think, com comes across all those realms. And to if I go back to the previous answer I, uh, I gave, which is around the strategy digital platforms organization reporting right up to the CEO, that reflects some of the focus we have as an organization. The way we are working through some of that is, and, and I'm giving a view from India Philippine standpoint, is we are looking at teams where we have digital teams that face off to the business, as well as the technology teams come together in an agile construct. So we are able to rapidly turn around capabilities for our customers. I think this is something that is going to happen across each of the lines of businesses as we accelerate on the digital journey. From an India standpoint, I think where we are is we, we already have this established. And I think this is only going to accelerate over the coming years. Where each company is on this journey from an India perspective could differ based on the maturity of the organization. So where I see Wells Fargo, we already quite mature. We have the capability, the skill set, and therefore we are rapidly moving through it. But I think this trend of India is just a systemic trend which will just increase. And I think a few things play into it. One, if you look at the India ecosystem, there is a huge talent in the fintechs, in, in, in the digital space. That's because we have capabilities in companies such as Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank, and a bunch of other firms where you have people who have this experience of doing this at hyperscale. Second, I think India also has a very bustling and continuously innovating fintech setup. If you look at the Paytms of the world, the Ola monies of the world, the Amazon Pays of the world. So you have that capability in terms of skill, even in the local India market. So if I bring the two of them together, I think digital is one of those places where India is poised to kind of do more and more in all the organizations. I think the other thing that will play into acceleration of what happens in digital and organizations more from India is some of the impact that has come in through COVID. Organizations have become more and more comfortable with going vir virtual. And I think that will play in a lot more things happening uh, from an India standpoint. And I think the last thing that will really drive some of the capability build out in India across organizations is the maturity we are seeing from a telecom standpoint, right? There's 4G, 5G is around the corner. There are fantastic collaboration tools now available. And really, all of us have, have gone really comfortable working virtual. This call is an example. Zoom calls where in your personal life you attend birthdays, weddings, and such. So people have become just very, very comfortable working virtually. So this triple merger, if I may say, of capability, of technology enabling it, as well as uh, the most critical human factor of it being able to work together is just going to accelerate what we do from an India perspective. So that's my sense of sense of things. So back to you, Mashir. Alice, how are you seeing it um, in, uh, in the Middle East? You spoke about the different ways the bank is looking both from an internal and external perspective. But when it comes to digital, tra digital transformation, how are you uh, approaching it? And uh, do you look at centers like in places like India or in other emerging markets for your technology needs? Yeah, I think the uh, good interesting things happened uh, before COVID and after COVID. Uh, before COVID, when we talk about digital transformation, it's more focused on the digital insight, like uh, provide intelligent uh, automation, uh, in increase the STP process rate. And for digital outside, it's more like uh, provide the app, have the digital online banking portal, something like that. But after COVID, uh, for the digital insight, actually, we need to think about a new topic is how to make a, your work from anywhere, right? So you see in India case, even in the uh, Middle East, we have the almost uh, nine months in last year, everybody work from home. But this year, how we to leverage this by have the more the uh, operation uh, running from anywhere. So it's a new topic for us. Uh, based on the new uh, challenge, the banking system have to be changed also. Before uh, COVID, we actually build our data center. So we follow our uh, GRC uh, framework to management the risk uh, 
and follow the compliance. Everything is put on the one place. But after COVID, it go to the cloud. So we must follow the new compliance, new regulation, how we to manage the data in the cloud, even in different place. So uh, after COVID, when we talk about digital transformation, it's more like how you to uh, adapt your operation environment to the new uh, uh, challenge, like uh, work from anywhere and uh, more the uh, uh, integration you have to do. So for example, uh, after COVID, when we uh, provide the app to service our customer, it's not just the one ask you to provide the uh, regular uh, service, like a loan service, like uh, uh, payment service. They are ask you is how can I get a quick loan immediately because the uh, the pandemic before the bank maybe take the uh, three day to run the process, but now they ask you to give it that long, three seconds. So how you to uh, redesign the process uh, based on the digital credit and even some people your client ask for the more service like uh, healthy care. Because the pandemic is not just the uh, get the money in business or service from you. They ask him more because that is a new demand from our client. Even like a digital inside out, uh, we need to think about a supply chain, global supply chain financial service. So you not just service the one press, one customer. You have to think uh, how you to service the build a network service the different customer in different place. And your car is work from anywhere. So it's a quite challenging how we to build a digital GRC framework to uh, reduce the risk, if, uh, still uh, follow the compliance from different central bank, and still you can uh, make your uh, bank system run from the central management to decentral management. It's quite a challenge. Uh, so that's the, when we talk about digital transformation before COVID and after COVID, it's a totally different. It, it is, you need to leverage the uh, uh, technology to uh, adapt to the new environment. And of course, so for that change, not just technology need to adapt to your uh, daily operation, you also need to change the DNA in your team because that is the, you have to run your bank like a FinTech. Because when we talk about the data, talk about cloud, talk about AI, talk about the, 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 the marketplace ecosystem, it's more like a bank do the FinTech things. So you have to change your team to have a new mindset, and then they can do a good job based on that. So that is a quite interesting, uh, quite interesting observation before COVID and after COVID when we talk about digital transformation. Thank you, and it's a very interesting point. Right? COVID-19 has accelerated a lot of the uh, digital transformation, digital uh, pickup, as well as I feel it's also accelerated decision-making uh, from top down. Everybody now sees the impact and what works or doesn't work. Um, Ash, I'm gonna bring you in here and, and just continuing the conversation here is how has COVID-19 changed uh, your bank strategy? How's Deutsche? dealing with this uh, in context of, you know, borderless and cross-border innovation, right? Uh, especially in a South Asia uh, uh, context. Um, I think my answer might be quite interesting because it may not, it may not resonate with some people around the room. So if I look at COVID-19, uh, it presented organizations across the world with a, a scenario that far exceeded even their most aggressive BCM plans, right? So not, not expected at all. And then, as Deutsche Bank, we witnessed some of the sharpest moves in financial markets. So our autobahn product, which is used by corporate banking clients, saw a 300% increase in client demand for electronic execution. We saw the material pickup in payments across Asia, which I mentioned earlier. And we saw a significant fall in the level of liquidity, which we had to help our clients with, especially in US dollars. But the key thing for Deutsche Bank is that COVID-19 may not have changed what we do strategically, but it did broaden the relationships tremendously. And it has changed how we provide our expertise to our clients. And also the level of interaction, and, and I think uh, Ellis was saying the same thing, the level of interaction with our clients has just gone into complete overdrive. 
And what I mean by that is that COVID-19 crisis has shown us that our role as a cross-border service provider has become even more important. And our customers are valuing flexibility and they're actually looking for opportunities to interact with us way more than they've done in the past. And I guess in many ways that shouldn't be surprising because customers have had their business models impacted significantly. And in some cases completely disrupted so much that they've had to reinvent themselves. So for us, simply being there for our clients at a time and place that they wanted was critical. So I'll give an example, last year, DB Asia, in partnership with a company called Symphony, we delivered the first social messaging platform dedicated for financial professionals. So it allows bankers, say, right, to communicate seamlessly, real time with clients. Clients can then choose their own preferred social media experience, for example, WeChat or WhatsApp, while still meeting the very stringent compliance and regulatory requirements that banks have in place. In parallel, what we have seen due to the impact of COVID-19 is a surge in requests from our customers, fintechs and uh, actually regulators too, to explore the use of digital assets and currencies. Now, we're already involved in the last six months, we've, we've got involved in an increasing number of proof of concepts, exploring digital asset interoperability, liquidity, cross-border connectivity, and we've even seen the feasibility of sustainability-themed digital bonds. So uh, all of this is accelerating in the last few months. I've seen some subtle changes in DB too. Now, DB has always had a customer focus and I touched on that at the beginning. Um, we often talk about providing our customers with the full suite of services. But one of the impacts of COVID is that it's really united our people in the organization and created a very strong sense of purpose. Now a customer is seen as a customer of Deutsche Bank and it doesn't belong to one business or another. So now we talk a lot more about holistic services, holistic experiences. And from the customer's perspective, they see far more coordinated coverage across their private, corporate, and financing needs. So in reality, for us to summarize, the pandemic, what it's really done is reassure us that, that we launched the right strategy in 2018 and that we're implementing it successfully, especially in Asia, Asia, which, by the way, contributes the most to Deutsche Bank's bottom line. And also, there's been some clear enablers that have been reinforced that we've already set out in our strategy. And I want to highlight just two because the team here has already mentioned them. The first one is the importance of our delivery hubs and tech centers, which is India. Now, Deutsche Bank's tech center here in India is its largest tech center. So employing outstanding techies, helping them improve their functional expertise, which is going to be key, encouraging them to collaborate and share with each other, and empowering them to innovate is a strategic priority for us, just like Wells Fargo and, 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 and the other guys too. Now, I've also mentioned uh, innovation and fintech a few times, and so has everybody else on the panel. And I just want to highlight that the importance of India which continues to be the third largest tech startup ecosystem in the world. It is also home to the second largest fintech startup base for digital lending, digital payments, and wealth management. So it's crucial. So nurturing and collaborating with them and, and with the whole of the India fintech ecosystem, as Bharat mentioned, is critical for us too. And a small, small example of that is how we were the title sponsors for Eureka 2020, which is the largest business model competition in Asia. So we're gonna see a lot more interaction with that fintech ecosystem, just like Wells and the, and the other guys too. Um, Ratna, how have you been looking at this in the, especially from a, a Europe context to uh, the India context, how have you looked at the impact of COVID in your bank's uh, strategy? Well, add to what I agree to uh, what Ash just mentioned, a lot of it uh, is quite applicable to what uh, how we perceive uh, the post impact of COVID. Um, additionally, I would like to uh, say that some of the learnings is, is, is key for us where we realize the, uh, the need for the contactless way of doing things, right? Starting with uh, recruiting our staff uh, where we had to do onboarding. Similarly, we had to do you know, a lot of KYC for um, new customers that we acquired for whom we had to do completely deliver contactless onboarding. So uh, we recognize a lot of services where uh, these type of um, contactless, uh, I would say, uh, technology needed to be developed uh, very quickly uh, where it was already not there. And then we looked at where are the grounds where these type of technologies are most applicable, of course, in France and Africa and um, and other areas but i think the the maximum requirements were in the areas where we were onboarding a lot of new customers so the experience the um, modernizing our applications to suit this type of uh, integration of external platforms was crucial and key and we had to deliver it at uh, speed 
And that is something that we did uh, quite fast. And then we also realized that when you, when you have a lot of staff not available in office where they used to work with a lot of physical documents, um, the doc checking, the whole checks uh, that we used to perform on the operation side, especially uh, in the fraudulent uh, check areas, the AML areas and other crucial areas, even in the KYC business, is where we realized that we needed to uh, implement hyper automation and use a lot of AI um, in these type of areas where the doc checking completely is now implement. I think uh, these are the good effects of COVID where now certain areas are completely automated, which I think would have normally uh, not been prioritized in normal times. And the, the realization that we have is by prioritizing these areas, I think we have secured a lot of space in terms of fraud. And we have achieved a lot of efficiency internally by being able to automate end-to-end -end on um, document checks and uh, fraud. Uh, I would also extend our learning also to recognize the spaces where we have very large banking processes, right? Um, you know, legacy processes, which of course are going through small transformations, uh, which had not undergone complete reimagination. So when uh, these processes encountered, uh, when I mean, during the pandemic times is when we realized part of the processes needed to be put in specific geographies and not spread across uh, geographies where the handover elements um, in COVID affected areas was uh, really painful. And these are the areas where we realized that we intelligently now have placed the processes where they belong. And also the process automation uh, with using AI has been prioritized, of course, it, it takes a long time. So in the next three to five years, we should be able to achieve 80% of this automation. But today, I think we stand at around 30 to 35%, which is not bad. But achieving this 30 to 35% to moving to 80% is a very significant target that we have set ourselves uh, during the pandemic times. And we have now rolled up our sleeves to execute the strategy. And uh, we have very clear mandate, um, investment, um, organization, and collaboration around this type of uh, achieving this type of uh, large scale automation uh, of course using technology and technology itself is now being ingrained um, for PNL certification for all the areas where we thought you know the, there's a common thing in the bank you know these are complex areas and this is where you really need to uh, come last uh, in terms of automation and those are the areas which now comes first uh, post post-COVID, and that's a very bright future that we see in terms of uh, innovation and digital transformation during COVID. Of course, I all, uh, also agree to all, all the things Ash said in terms of how we have uh, been affected during the pandemic from uh, using the remote logins, et cetera. And I think that is something that all of us have faced together. And we've successfully come, come out of it, um, you know, renouncing a lot of things that we normally traditionally did and now adopting to new ways of and every process, every outlook is now digital as Bharat mentioned as well. And uh, it is important for us to now see uh, from a customer's point of view, how they see um, banking, how they look at experiences, how they would like to integrate all services um, into one platform. And we are also looking at integration and holistic services as uh, someone else. Thank you, Ratna. Bharat, moving to you, uh, how have uh, you looked at it? Uh, and is it good to get a comparison sense of uh, wealth from uh, India versus Philippines perspective, as well as uh, in the States? How have you seen that response to COVID and uh, how that impacted the strategy? We were always on that journey to move from a to a digital standpoint, right? I think what COVID-19 has really done is really, really accelerate. And the kind of customer adoption we have seen on our digital channels is is just is just spiked. So I would say from a digital standpoint, two aspects to look at. There is yes, the additional feature set that's needed, which is give customers more ability to do things through our online mobile app, have omni-channel experience where customers irrespective of channel get the same digital experience. So more feature set built out. But the other thing that we have been actively working through over the last year is when you see these multiple X uh, load and uh, focus coming to digital channels, you have to ensure that the digital platforms themselves are scalable as well as stable. 
So the, that's another piece that we have worked on very, very actively. As we see those increasing volume coming in, we need to make sure that customer experience from a channel perspective continues to be seamless. We have to be very, very cognizant of the fact that for our customers, our community, small business, last year and this year has been a really, really challenging year. And we need to do everything to make sure their experience is seamless. A great example is the payment protection program, the PPP program that got launched in the US last year for small businesses, right? There was a huge focus to disperse some of those funds to the, to the, to the right businesses that required it. We actively put together an end-to-end -end intelligent automation and through 2020, we dispersed close to 194,000 loans worth more than $10 billion for our small businesses. Each of these pieces makes a real difference to our customers and bringing in the right mix of automation, intelligent automation, bots and such really helped move the needle forward. There are some really, really gratifying, heartwarming stories that we heard. We heard about a restaurant owner, right? Getting an online loan approval or opening a digital banking account to meet their business needs or being able to do online buy transfers for COVID kids. All of this was digital. And, I, and, and what makes me really happy is a lot of the work for this was done through our India Philippines office. I think this will only continue to accelerate uh, and Ash has alluded to some of the reasons that will help drive it. But I think from a COVID standpoint, what we are seeing is an acceleration on a journey that already was there. And I think this again will become one of those systemic trends that will continue even when we go back to the niche, to the cliche new normal as they say, right? I think this is one of those systemic trends that is here to stay. Back to Thanks, brother. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna you know segue uh, Ash and we're coming towards the end of the panel. We have about five minutes or so left. So I uh, would appreciate uh, uh, shorter answers, but Ash, um, building on from there, right? How, how is the response now to remote working? Uh, in financial services, you know, there's always been the issues with compliance. BCP was good for a couple of days, but when you talk about months and now a couple of years, that kind of changes how you uh, interact right, and how you look at it. A trading could not have been done previously outside of that trading room. You couldn't step out without a card, but now people are sitting in their homes and doing the same. So can we see remote working becoming a trend? Uh, I see a lot of banks here in Hong Kong locally uh, making that as an option. And I think that's going to be a longer term trend. Uh, how are you seeing it from Deutsche? Are you expecting this to be more uh, a longer term trend where remote working will become uh, normal uh, or the new normal as Bharat was mentioning? I think the, the answer to that one is quite straightforward. When you've seen 1.7 trillion euros of capital raised in the debt market, which is an all-time high for Deutsche Bank, never mind the pandemic, when you've, you've mentioned, when you've got traders remote working around the world, which was unimaginable before, I think we know where we're heading. And I think here, the, the, there's a lot of things that we've learned, right? And, and what Deutsche Bank is officially doing is taking stock of experience during the pandemic but there's one thing for sure that we've learned a lot and all these factors need to be considered, in, considered in, uh, and taken into account before we decide exactly what we do. Now, I just want to mention a few things that I think we've all learned. You know, freedom of choice and movement is a key part of any human being's mental health, you know, well-being. We've learned some roles can easily be performed at home. Traders can trade just as well, if not better than in the office. People step up when they're given clear goals and outcomes and they don't want to let the company down even if they are working from home. And there's potentially an untapped market of talent in smaller cities, especially women who might find it difficult to migrate or shift bases. But at the same time, there is a need to be in the office. Um, there may be some roles that are highly regulated. Uh, there may be some roles that require secured access to technology. And there are some people who don't find their home environment at all conducive for work and prefer the facilities of the office. And of course, there's some activities such as brainstorming, planning, face-to-face -face training, or simply team and culture building that are best done in the office. So to cut a long story short, DB will almost certainly operate in a hybrid model where a significant percentage X, and I can't disclose that today because I don't know it, but it'll be a high number, will almost definitely work remotely subject to all of the regulatory approvals. Tell us what's, what's been the, for, for you, how have you seen it? Dubai was one of the few uh, locations that kind of tried to keep things going and business open for quite some time and they still do have that almost open door policy. How has that impacted uh, business on the ground from a remote working perspective or are more people yeah. comfortable coming to office? 
Yeah, um, much Japan is based in UAE, but actually we have a global the branch in uh, nine countries. So from this year, we try to build a new working model. So we set up the COE uh, Center of the SLM from the uh, Bangla first. So we try to leverage the local talent, local fintech uh, to let uh, our staff can work from anywhere. Also support the local business. So we are trying to build the uh, business network from this year. So more and more COE will to be built in this year and uh, support a different uh, market like uh, Egypt, uh, India, and Hong Kong, even the US. So that is the new operation model as the bank before we move forward on the central, central management. But from this year, we are more focused on the decentralized management, no matter is the staff management or uh, technology management or the uh, business management, because it's the decentralized, it's move to the cloud. You can do the, uh, anything from anywhere. So that is the very interesting thing, especially when we talk about a digital transformation. It's a new challenge, but a lot of opportunity. Now, sharp and quick, um, we have Coming to the end of the panel, what I will do is give each of you 30 seconds, very tight, but uh, if you had to talk about a systematic trend for cross-border environment, what would be one critical element that you think is essential for, for banks uh, to innovate uh, in a cross-border environment? So 30 seconds, if you could uh, quickly do that. Let's start with Rakha. Extending a lot of communication and real-time activity with the customers, I think, is the key for uh, innovating for the customers and taking in feedback and being able to analyze the data and performing actions. So to me, data and communication is the key. Thank you very much. Ash? Just very quickly, I think the trend towards national interest and the protection of supply chains, call it uh, techno-nationalism, definitely worries me a lot. And we've got to make sure that it doesn't become a, a serious inhibitor to cross-border transactions because it will prevent you know, a cohesive emergence of cryptocurrencies, for example. A big topic, and probably a discussion for another day, for sure. It could be a discussion for days as well, considering what's happening in this space, right? Uh, um, Bharat? And ability to collaborate and uh, leverage some of our uh, virtual collaboration platforms effectively, along with having the right uh, sponsorship, I would say, top of the house, as well as skills on the ground, I think would be the top drivers to help to take this forward. Yeah, for the Macho Band, the only in things we want to focus is the customer century. That is quite important. Based on that goal, we can leverage different technology, different operation model, but customer century is our focus. You know, in addition to uh, what you all have said, I think culture is going to play a very big role and 2020 has been that landmark year where culture has had a push and everybody is accepting things. Uh, thank you. It's, it's been one of, the, I've, I've moderated dozens of sessions, but this has been one of the most informative sessions I've sat in to listen to. So thank you all for uh, such deep and wonderful insights. I think our, pro our audience is privileged to listen to the collective uh, leadership that's there on this panel. I look forward to staying in touch with all of you and for the audience, uh, feel free to get in touch with the speakers via LinkedIn. You have their names and profiles. And thank you to ETBFSI for having us today on this panel. Thank you everybody.